we will continue with the hadith number six. Uh, in the last session, I read the hadith in Arabic, then I translated it as well. Today, inshallah, I'll just mention the translation of the hadith, hadith number six. This hadith is narrated by Sayyiduna Abu Ishaq Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, companion of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I'll mention the hadith and I'll come back to this Sahabi. He's, he is from the um, Ash, Ashara Mubashara, the ten companions who were promised, whilst they were alive, they were promised that they will enter paradise. He says that the Prophet ﷺ came to him to visit him in the year of the final farewell Hajj uh, because he had fallen ill and his illness was very severe. And when the Prophet ﷺ came to visit him, he said, I said, O oh, Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam I am in this state which you can see this severe illness that you can see and I am extremely wealthy I do not have except a daughter who will inherit from me I only have a daughter who will inherit from me and I have a lot of wealth should I give two-thirds of my wealth as sadaqah, as charity the Prophet ﷺ said to him, no. Then he said, then should I give a half, half of my wealth into charity? The Prophet ﷺ said to him, no. Then he said, so then should I give a third of my wealth into charity, O Messenger of Allah ﷺ, to which the Prophet ﷺ said, a third, a third is a lot or a third is much, meaning third is good. Then the Prophet ﷺ continued and said that it is better for you to leave your family wealthy or well off than leaving them poor and stretching their hands out to others. It's better for you to leave your family sufficient, aghniya, well off, rich, rather than leaving them alatan, poor, to such a degree that they have to beg and if you you do not spend anything on your family seeking with it the pleasure of Allah except that you are rewarded with it or you are rewarded due to it meaning you do not spend anything on your family that you have the intention of pleasing Allah except that you will be rewarded except that you will be rewarded so much so that even the morsel that you place into the, mouth, uh, into the mouth of your wife, even for that you will be rewarded. Then he said, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, will I survive after my companions? Will I survive after my companions? The Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam said, you will not survive and do good deeds with the intention of those good deeds being purely for Allah except that you will increase in rank and in elevation meaning if you do survive this is what you should do you should do good deeds for the sake of Allah and then you will increase in rank and elevation and perhaps you will the Prophet ﷺ then said perhaps you will outlive your companions so much so that many people will benefit from you and other people will be harmed by you then the prophet sallallahu done dua oh allah complete for my companions their migration and do not turn them onto their heels I mean do not turn them back from their migration then the hadith ended and some say this is an addition some say this is part of the hadith that uh, sa'd ibn khawla is unfortunate or Sa'd ibn Khawla, the unfortunate. There are a number of ways how this can be translated. The Prophet wasallam lamented Sa'd ibn Khawla, meaning the Prophet wasallam was upset at Sa'd ibn Khawla that he died in Makkah. Now this is the hadith. First and foremost, Sayyiduna Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, this companion, who is he? Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu is from the very close companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
the companions, the Sahaba would say to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Fidaka ummi wa abi ya Rasulullah, or bi abi wa ummi ya Rasulullah. May my mother and father be sacrificed unto you, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They would say this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say this to Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas. O Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, may my father and mother be sacrificed on you. That's how much the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved him. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was at one point extremely ill, and some narrations mention that this is the illness where the Prophet ﷺ done dua for him. If you have time, inshallah, I'll mention the dua, and then he was cured from his illness. He is the first person who bled for the sake of Islam. Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, he's the first person who bled for the sake of Islam, I meaning he was injured for the sake of Islam. And he's the first person who threw an arrow, I meaning he shot an arrow from his bow in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's the first person who bled for Islam and he's the first person who shot an arrow for Islam. And there are many narrations regarding his uh, shuja'a regarding his bravery radiallahu ta'ala anhu and many narrations regarding his firmness to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how firmly he would follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam many narrations regarding his zuhd his abstinence from the dunya uh, and also his being mustajabu da'wah that whenever he would do dua his dua would be accepted Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu and from him are reported approximately 270 hadiths approximately 270 hadiths are narrated by Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu he passed away there's a difference of opinion as to when he passed away he passed away from year 55 to 58 one of those years 55, 56, 57, 58 Hijri, one of those years are the years of his passing radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So after the migration, after the migration, he lived for between 55 to 58 years. And then some historians, scholars of uh, history say that he, they span from the year of 60 years old to 90 years old. So very ambiguous as to how old he was when he passed away. The narration span from 60 to 90 years old, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And you can see he's very beloved to the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. So, in this narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to him, and at this point he is in Makkah al Mukarramah, in the farewell Hajj, it's the last Hajj, and he's become very ill, and the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam comes to visit him. So what I'm going to do now, I'll mention the, the specific points of the narration. So the first thing we understand from this narration is that the Prophet ﷺ visited him. Why? Because he was ill. This is visiting the ill. This is the best of all creation, the leader of Prophets والسلام, going out of his way to visit one of his followers because they had fallen ill. So we learn from this that for an Imam, for a leader of a community, and for every single Muslim, it is a sunnah that if somebody you are, you know, falls ill, you go and visit them. You go and visit them. You know someone and they've fallen ill, you go to visit them, see how they are. Not that you know that they've fallen ill and then that's it, our connection has now ended. I don't have anything to do with you. If you have a friend and they've fallen ill, then you should go visit them. And if this is with a friend, if this is a relative, then it's even more important and emphasized that you should go and visit your relative when they have fallen ill. There's a whole chapter which is coming regarding um, visiting the ill and the conduct of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. So I'll not um, uh, speak about this too much. Another point from this hadith. Sayyiduna Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas he mentioned his illness to the Prophet ﷺ. From this, we understand that it is permissible for a person to mention the illness with a good intention. 
if somebody falls ill and they start speaking about their illness to every person and the intention is there's no intention or they're probably complaining about their condition this is not a good adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you've fallen ill and somebody comes and meets you and asks you how are you and you start giving your whole medical history about all your illnesses what's your intention why are you mentioning all of these illnesses to this person is this a qualified physician qualified doctor who's going to uh, diagnose you and uh, give you some medicine if not there's no reason for you to mention this uh, in commentary of this the ulama mentioned a number of things you can mention your illness to a doctor, of course. You're not going to go to a doctor and the doctor's going to ask you what's wrong with you and you say, you know what, I don't want to tell you my illness because there's bad other. You have to tell your illness to the doctor so he can give you some kind of medication and cure. So, what's your intention? If, for example, a righteous person, you meet a, a Rajul Salih, a righteous person, a man of Allah, a woman of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they ask you, how are you? And you can tell them regarding your illness with the intention that they are going to do dua for you. If you know this person looks like a righteous person, or this person is a righteous person, I want them to do dua for me, then you can tell them, you know, I've actually got this illness, or I've got this problem, I'm in this difficult situation, can you do dua for me? Here your intention is to get dua from this person, supplication from this person. So, revealing your illness, we learn from this hadith, revealing your illness can become a means of reward. But why are you revealing your illness? Somebody meets you, you've met them after a number of days, they have no uh, medical qualifications, then you've got to start speaking about your illnesses. I've got this illness, that illness, another illness. Sometimes, you meet somebody and you tell them about your illness, they start telling you about their illnesses. So <laughs> I've got this illness as well, I've got this illness as well. This becomes counterproductive to the conversation. Why are you telling each other of your problems? If there is a good intention behind this, this person can help me, this person can guide me, then of course this is good. This person can do dua for me, of course this is good. But this all revolves around the intention. Another point. Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he referred to himself as Dhumal. Dhumal in Arabic language is only used for a person who's not just rich, he's very rich. Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, was very rich. He was very affluent in the community, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. From this point, the fact that he was an affluent person, and he was from the promised Paradise. He's from the Sahaba who promised paradise. The ulama say it's permissible to gather wealth, halal wealth, with the righteous intention. So if a person wants to gather wealth, but the intention is, I'm gathering this wealth, and the intention, for example, so that I can establish a school. I'm gathering this wealth so that I can give it into good cause. I'm gathering this wealth so in the future, if the Muslims need a donation so that they can, uh, so it can help the community of Muslims, then I'll give them this wealth. So it's permissible to gather wealth, but what is your intention? So Imam al nawawi from this hadith, he says, it's not the case that it's completely impermissible to gather wealth, this is dunya, let go of this, run away from this. But no, you can gather wealth. You can gather money, spend your time gathering the money with righteous intentions and this act becomes righteous and rewarding as well. This act becomes righteous and rewarding as well. There's a legal ruling which is derived, it's not derived from this hadith, but this hadith also points to the legal ruling about um, making a will. So inshallah, if we get to that point, I'll speak about that then. But for now, we'll leave that discussion. In this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, it's better for you to leave your heirs rich and wealthy than leaving them poor and begging people for uh, food and money. From this narration, we come to understand. And remember, in the narration, how many uh, people did he have 
who are going to inherit from him so that's the that's the that this is why we need commentary he had one daughter but that's the daughter is not the only person who will inherit there are many inheritors the wuratha the heirs of a person are many the parents are heirs the children are heirs the siblings are heirs so these are all the people who will receive from this per dying person but he says I only have one daughter, meaning this is my only, there's a number of commentaries regarding what does this mean. Uh, some ulama say he had other children as well. Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas had other children as well. But he was worried about this daughter more. For whatever reason, maybe she was unwell and he was worried about her more. Or he had the other children, he had three sons that are mentioned. He had them after this narration. So a number of the things that I mentioned why he singled out this daughter. But in a nutshell, even though, let's say he did have this one daughter, she's not the only heir, there are more heirs, more relatives who will inherit this money. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying to him, it's better for you to leave your inheritors or your heirs wealthy than leaving them poor and begging. From this hadith, this part of the hadith, we learn husnu suluk, good conduct with your relatives. The Prophet ﷺ is teaching this Sahabi, even after you pass away, have good conduct with your relatives. So when you are alive, of course you must have good conduct. But even at the point of death, think about your relatives. Husnu suluk, have good conduct with your relatives. So at the point of death, Yes, you can. He's saying, I want to give two thirds of my wealth in the way of Allah. The Prophet says, No. He says, Okay, I want to give half of my wealth in the way of Allah. The Prophet says, No. Then he says, Okay, a third. The Prophet said, Yes, a third is a lot. And then the two third, leave that. Leave it for your heirs so that they can benefit from your wealth. But what's your intention? What's your intention with this? The intention is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Later on in the hadith we realize the Prophet ﷺ clarifies and mentions this act you're doing, that I'm leaving my wealth for my relatives. Why? For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want them to beg. I want to leave this for them so that they can suffice themselves. So even at this point, this can become a rewarding act. Uh, Ibn Kamal Pasha, in the end of this hadith, he mentions something beautiful. He says, You're, in this hadith, we learn the secret of wealth, the secret of money. The Prophet ﷺ is teaching Sayyiduna Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas anhu, the secret of wealth. How you can benefit from your wealth when you die, and you can benefit from your wealth as you live. You'll have these two states. These are your two states, death and life. If you have money, you can benefit from this money in the court of Allah as you are alive. And as you die, you can still benefit. How? He says, if you die and your intention is, I want to leave this money for my relatives to create uh, silatul rahim, that the, the connections between the relatives grow stronger. That my wealth is distributed amongst my relatives so that this connection between them grows stronger. Then you die and your wealth will benefit you. But then you're alive. What if you're alive? The Prophet ﷺ said that when you are alive, the nafaqa, the word nafaqa is used for money a person spends on his family. Maintenance. Your maintenance, even with your maintenance of your family, you can acquire the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To such a degree, the bite of food you place into the mouth of your wife, even with that bite of food, you can gain reward. How? <coughs> with the intention of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every commentary I've read mentioned this, that a, the per, a man's relationship with his wife fundamentally is a worldly relationship. That's all it is. Fund, fundamentally, it's a worldly relationship. You can eventually make this into a relationship revolving around the deen. But this is purely for the person, purely for the couple. Their relationship is to benefit them. This fundamentally just for them. But something so little 
as placing one bite of food into the mouth of the wife. How little is this? How insignificant does this seem? But with something so insignificant, you can acquire the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine doing more. Imagine doing more. If with one bite of food you give to your wife, you can gain reward. Then imagine the amount of reward you can gain with doing other than this. You are looking after your family and this is a house that we're living in so we can have a good life in this house. Why did I buy this house? Why are we living in this house? So that we can live and nurture our children in this house with, uh, with, without any disruption, without any interruption. We can nurture our own children the way Allah and His Beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have instructed us. You buying this house becomes a reward. Mawlana Jalaluddin Rumi in his Masnavi, it's a famous uh, story he mentions about a man who made a window in his uh, house. So he built a house and he put a window in his house. And then the story, someone asked the man, what's this window for? Why did you have this window? And he says, windows for light. The window is for light. And the person questioning him said, if you made the intention that this window is for light and also that when the azan is going to be done, I can hear the azan through this window. You would have received reward for making this window. So you're buying a house. Such a huge thing, not a small thing buying a house. A huge commitment. Especially if you go on mortgage, it's a whole lifetime commitment. But what's your intention? Why am I buying this house? So I can run away from my parents? <laughs> Why am I buying this house? What's the intention behind buying this house? If your intention is I'm buying this house so that I can nurture my children in this home. I'm buying this house so I can ease the troubles from my parents. Because this is a responsibility of the, it becomes a responsibility of the parents when the son is married and is living with the parents. So these are all good intentions you've made to buy this house. And this buying this house becomes a reward. Why? Because I've done this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But we need to be very meticulous with our intentions and with our acts. What do I mean? If somebody says, I'm going to take my kids to Disneyland, takes his kids to Disneyland, but the masjid is only two, three miles away, has never taken his kids to the masjid, then there's a problem with this. I'm spending on my family, I'm taking them left, right and center. Well, why don't you take them first to your local masjid? Show them this is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This land will be a witness of your iman on the day of judgment. This land, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has said, is a land from the lands of paradise. Create this love into the hearts of your children. Be realistic with your intention. If you think, yes, I'm going to get a reward by spending on my family. I'm going to get my son the new PlayStation and make a good intention. No, don't try to find loopholes. Be real with your intention. What is my intention with what I'm doing in my family? And if something as small as giving one morsel to your wife can be a reward, then of course, the great, the more you spend with the better intention will become a reward in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. <coughs> That's the intention. So this hadith has been mentioned in this chapter of ikhlas, sincerity, and sincerity is an attribute of the intention. The hadith then continues where Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas asked the Prophet Sallallahu Ya Rasulullah, will I live, um, will my life be longer than my companions? Will I outlive my companions? <coughs> the Prophet, so he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this question. What did he believe regarding the Prophet ﷺ? If he believed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given him any special knowledge and my knowledge and the knowledge of the Prophet ﷺ is similar, would he have asked this question? 
Of course, Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu ta'ala who had the belief Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given my beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam some knowledge of the unseen. Then of course, this is why he has asked this question. Every commentary you'll find, Nuzhatul Muttaqin very specifically mentions, this is a proof Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given certain knowledge of certain unseen aspects to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in this hadith then says to his companion that the, um, the meaning of which is if you live then you should do good deeds with the intention purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this point the ulama say that it's about having a long life people always do dua for long life people yearn for a long life from this hadith we come to understand a long life is not a blessing. A long righteous life is a blessing. Someone can live for a hundred years, but if this life is no good, then this is, this is worse than somebody who lived one year in Islam and done good deeds for one year. So simply doing dua, oh Allah, give me a long life, this is not a good dua. A good dua is, oh Allah, give me a long righteous life. A, a long, righteous life. The Prophet ﷺ in this hadith is doing tarbiyat, nurturing his sahabi that is not as simple as living a long life. If you do live a long life, then live a good life. And then the Prophet ﷺ said to his sahabi that if you do live, or perhaps you will live, and a nation will benefit from you and others will be harmed by, um, by you, this is from the knowledge of the Prophet ﷺ. What happened was Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas became better from this illness and he lived and he surpassed his companions and he, he was a conqueror of uh, Iraq. Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas conquered Iraq and uh, many people accepted Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ said many people will benefit from you. Many people did benefit from him by the fact that he conquered Iraq and many people accepted Islam on the hands of Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. This is from the knowledge of the Prophet ﷺ. Another reason why Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas asked and I'll finish with uh, this point on this hadith about surpassing his companions is that he had fallen ill in Mecca but he had left Mecca and migrated towards Madinatul Munawwara amongst the Sahaba a person who has left Mecca and migrated towards Medina will never return back to Mecca to live this was known fact amongst Sahaba they would consider if a person who has left Mecca and migrated towards Medina, if he dies in Mecca, this will destroy his migration. He'll lose the reward of his migration. Why you've migrated for the sake of Allah, you are not to die back in this land. If you are to die, you will die in the land of your migration. So another reason why he asked this question was out of fear, because he has fallen ill in Mecca. And he was fearing, I don't want to die in Mecca because I've left this land for the sake of Allah. If I die, I want to die in Medina. And, and this is the end part of the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ done dua. Oh Allah, complete for my companions their migration. Meaning, yes, 10 years ago they left Mecca. 10 years ago they left Mecca. But Ya Allah, keep them firm on this migration. Keep them firm on this migration. Do not turn them back to Mecca. That's why if you read the seerah, every Sahabi who left Mecca did not return back to Mecca to live. Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Ali, radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een. Did they return back to Mecca? Their businesses were in Mecca, their homes were in Mecca, their families were in Mecca, but they did not return. Why? We've left this city for the sake of Allah. What we learn from this, once you make a firm intention to leave something for the sake of Allah, I'm going to leave backbiting for the sake of Allah. Do not go back to backbiting. I'm leaving, missing my salah for the sake of Allah. Do not go back to missing your salah. That's what we learn from this narration. Once you migrate for the sake of Allah, you do not go back to that which you migrated from. And in the end part of the hadith, about Sa'd ibn Khawla. Sa'd ibn Khawla migrated from Mecca to Medina. But then Sa'd ibn Khawla 
Allah ta'ala and his companion came back to Mecca for business uh, and some commentaries just mentioned that he then intended that I'm going to stay in Mecca and he passed away in Mecca and the Prophet وسلم, was upset that he had left Mecca for the sake of Allah but then he came back and he passed away in Mecca and this the Prophet وسلم, would be upset by this radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in so this was the hadith of Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu with his commentary now inshallah we can move on to the next hadith وعن أبي هريرة عبد الرحمن بن صخر رضي الله تعالى عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الله لا ينظر إلى أجسامكم ولا إلى صوركم ولكن ينظر إلى قلوبكم وأعمال وأعمالكم رواه مسلم. This hadith is narrated by Sayyidina Abu Huraira عبد الرحمن بن صخر رضي الله تعالى Anhu. He said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam said, Inna Allah, certainly Allah la yanzuru ila ajsamikum, does not look at your bodies, wala ila suwarikum, and does not look at your forms, wala kin yanzuru ila kulubikum, however, or rather, yanzuru ila kulubikum, he looks at your hearts. وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ And he looks at your actions. رواه مسلم إمام مسلم رحمه الله تعالى narrates this hadith. Sayyiduna Abu Huraira رضي الله تعالى and who needs no introduction. One of the greatest narrators of hadith. His name, there's a difference of opinion as to what his name was. Um, Ibn Allan رحمه الله تعالى he mentions there's 35 narrations as to what his name was. <laughs> Meaning there's 39 possibilities as to what his name actually was. The position Imam Nawawi takes is that his name is Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhar. How Abu Huraira, as you might be aware, is known as, the, it means the father of the kitten. The father of the kitten. The father of the small cat. Why was he named this? The narration is famous. That one day, Sayyiduna Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and had a small cat and he was playing with a small cat and he used to have this cat in his sleeve. So he used to have big sleeves and he had a small cat in his sleeves. And once the Prophet ﷺ came and saw the cat and the Prophet ﷺ said, what's this? And he said, oh Messenger of Allah ﷺ, this is a hirrun, it's a cat. And the Prophet ﷺ then said to him, Ya Aba Huraira, oh the father of the little cat. This saying of the Prophet ﷺ was so accepted that this was his name. This is as he is known. That's why there's 35 narrations as to what his real name might be. Abu Huraira, a blessing from the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this hadith said that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala does not look at your ajsamikum wala ila suwarikum. Ajsam is a plural of jism. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't look at your form. Wala ila suwarikum, uh, sorry, your bodies. Wala ila suwarikum and does not look at your form. A question uh, 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 Ibn Kamal Pasha uh, presents. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees everything. Nothing is hidden from the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does it mean that Allah does not look at your bodies and does not look at your forms? It means the acceptance of your action does not depend on your bodies and does not depend on your forms. When your acts are maqbool, accepted in the court of Allah, it does not depend on your jism. Is your jism big or is it small? Tall or short? Big or small? Nor does the acceptance of your deeds depend on your surah, which is a singular of suwar, your form. What color is your skin? What color are your eyes? What color is your beard? How big are your fingers? How small are your hands? How big is your nose? How small are your ears? Your sewer, your forms do not affect your deeds. So how you look does not affect whether your good deeds will be accepted. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look at? Meaning, what does determine whether your actions are accepted or rejected? Your hearts. 
What does this mean? Your intention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at your intention. So you might be a really big, tall person, strong person. And you've done a huge good deed. But what determines whether your act is accepted is not your form. It depends on your intention. What was your intention when you done this good deed? What was your intention when you done this good deed? From this hadith we learn, number one, that the acceptance and rejection of the act does not depend on the form of the person, but rather what's in the heart of the person. Yes, but we also learn, learn from this hadith is that we actually need to focus on our heart as well. We need to sit down and give time to reflect over our heart. We learn this from this hadith. We seriously need to reflect on why we're doing certain acts. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at our hearts. Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala, he speaks about salah and praying salah. And he says, imagine that there's a person and the king is coming to his house. And he makes the house very beautiful from outside. Paints the house, fixes up anything that's messed up, cleans up the windows. Sets up everything nicely, cleans up everything. The king comes to the house and he looks so beautiful from the outside. Then he opens the door and the king steps foot into the house and it's absolutely disgusting. Inside smells. Inside is all gloomy. The paint is old and uh, the wallpaper is falling off, peeling off the wall and it smells. What's the king going to think? What, what does he think I am? Who does he think I am? Is this the respect I deserve? That he made the outside beautiful and I've come into his home and his home smells. This is his preparation for me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at our hearts. So we need to physically sit down, take out time and reflect. What's my intention behind this act? When I'm praying my salah, what's my intention? There was a, a, a bazurk, a saint once. He prayed in the masjid for 20 odd years with congregation. For 20 odd years he prayed his salah in the congregation in the masjid. One day he's getting late, so he's running towards the masjid as he's getting late. He's running and the thought crosses his mind, if I miss my jamaat, if I miss the congregation, what will the people think? Then he stopped. He was a person who would reflect over the heart, he stopped. And he said to himself, have you been praying for 20 years for people? Today your intention has come out. Today the reality has come out. Is this why you are praying? What will people say? Or are you praying for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So then he went to the masjid, he prayed his salah, and he repeated 20 years worth of salah. Why? It's possible my intention was corrupt for 20 years. My intention should have been only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shar'an, Legally, he didn't have to repeat the prayers, but this is a point of reflection. We need to think about our intentions before our actions. Why? Because the intention is the criteria of whether the action will be accepted or not. This beautifully takes us to the next hadith, narrated number eight by Sayyiduna. Well, I'll read the hadith in Arabic and you'll see the synthesis between the two hadith. وعن أبي موسى عبد الله بن قيس الأشعري رضي الله تعالى عنه قال سئل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عن الرجل يقاتل شجاعة ويقاتل حمية ويقاتل رياء أي ذلك في سبيل الله فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من قاتل لتكون كلمة الله هي العليا this narration is narrated by Sayyiduna Abu uh, Musa Abdullah ibn Qais al-Ash'ari, more commonly known as Abu Musa Ash'ari radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. He said, Su'ila Rasulullah, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked an rajul regarding a man, regarding a person, yuqatilu shuja'atan, who fought in the way of Allah shuda'atan to show his bravery. وَيُقَاتِلُ حَمِيَّةً And another person who fought حَمِيَّةً to defend his family and to defend the honor of his family. 
وَيُقَاتِلُ رِيَاءً And another person who fought, a third person who fought, رِيَاءً to show off. أَيُّ ذَلِكَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ O Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from these three people, who is in the way of Allah? Who is in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The actions are the same. But who is in the way of Allah? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ قَاتَلَ لِتَكُونَ كَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَا The one who fights so that the word of Allah is dominant, فَهُوَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ He is in the way of Allah. He is in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this narration, there are three people. There are three people. First person he fought, but his intention is shuja'ah, so that he can show that he's a brave person. So people will look at him fight and they'll think, this person's brave, look at how he's fighting. The second person fought hamiyyatan, for the family honor. Now the people will say that, such and such brotherly, they've got this person who's fighting for them. And he's fighting so wonderfully. Such an amazing warrior. So he's fighting to defend the honor of his family. And the third person, he's fighting Riya and so he can show off. Let the people look at me. How good a warrior am I? Now, the first person who's fighting out of bravery, he can fight for the sake of Allah as well. The second person who's fighting for, to, for the honor of his family can fight for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. But the third person who's fighting to show off, that's a pure, that's only his intention. He's just showing off. The commentators mentioned the Prophet could have said the first two. Because yes, they're fighting for the sake of Allah and they're brave and they're showing their bravery. Because you're meant to show your bravery, you can't go fighting and be walking crookedly and saying, you know, I can't really fight, I'm a bit weak. That's not how you fight. That's why there's the Sahaba would dye their beards. If the uh, hairs would turn white, they would dye their beards so that they could go to war and they'd look like young men. So you have to show bravery when you fight. That's why you have the Ramal when you do the Tawaf. You have to stick out your chest, stick out your shoulders and walk. Out of, as if you're expressing shuja'a. The second person who's fighting for the sake of his family is actually a good intention. I'm fighting for the sake of my family, to defend the honor of my family. The Prophet ﷺ could have mentioned these two, but the Prophet ﷺ, to avoid a, a confusion in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ kept it simple and kept one criteria. There's one criteria, there's one thing by means of which you can make this judgment. What is that? Who is fighting for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Whose intention is that I want to spread Allah's religion? The one who is fighting for the sake of Allah, he is in the way of Allah. So in the previous narration, we can see that in the previous narration, the forms are not looked at. These three people, their forms are exactly the same, but their forms are not looked at. Their ajsam, their bodies might be the same. But the bodies are not looked at. What's looked at? Their hearts. What was their intention? Why were they doing this act? Why were they doing this act? And this takes us to the next hadith. Now I'm going to mention the next hadith and give you a short commentary and then conclude. The next hadith, there's a beautiful synthesis between all the three hadiths. But as I've mentioned in the last lecture, when we come to the end, I'll bring all of the hadiths together and show you the synthesis between all the hadiths. There's 12 hadiths in this chapter. And inshallah at the end, I'll bring all of them together so you can see the mastery and tasawwuf of Imam al-Nawawi. Hadith 9. وَعَنْ أَبِي بَكْرَةَ نُفَيْعِ بْنِ الْحَارِثِ الثَّقَفِي رضي الله تعالى عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إذا التقى المسلمان بسيفيهما فالقاتل والمقتول في النار قلت يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم هذا القاتل فما بال المقتول قال إنه كان حريصا على قتل صاحبه متفق عليه This hadith narrated by Abu Bakr Nufay ibn al-Harith al-Thaqafi radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. 
He says that Anna Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Idhal taqal musliman When two Muslims meet bi sayfayhima with their swords Meaning when two Muslims fight one another فَالْقَاتِلُ وَالْمَقْتُولُ فِي النَّارِ Then the killer and the one killed will both be in the fire of hell. When two Muslims fight, the killer and the one killed will be in Nar, the fire of hell. قُلْتُ The narrator said, I said, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, هذا القاتل, this the killer, meaning we understand the killer, why he's going to hell. فَمَا بَالُ الْمَقْتُولُ What's the reason for the one killed? Why is the one being killed going to hell as well? The Prophet ﷺ said, The one killed, the one who is killed, إِنَّهُ كَانَ حَرِيسًا عَلَىٰ قَتْلِ صَاحِبِهِ He also wanted to kill his opponent. He, did he kill him? Did he want to kill him? Yes. So on one side, you have the killer. On the other side, you have the killed. The killer is going to hell. Unless Allah forgives him, unless Allah forgives him, they will not go to hell. But if Allah does not forgive them, the killer is going to hell. Why? Because he done the act. But the killed is going to hell as well. Why? Because he had a firm intention of killing. Had he been given the opportunity to kill the other person, he would have killed. Although he didn't kill, he had azam. We spoke about azam before. If you remember, azam is a firm intention. A person has made the firm intention and wattana nafsahu, he's prepared himself. I'm ready, I'm going to kill this person. And he dies himself, he's going to hell. As the Prophet ﷺ said, both of them are going to hell. Of course, their levels may be different. One may be punished more than the other in Jahannam, but both of them are going to hell. One of them had the intention and fulfilled the bad intention. The other one had the bad intention, wasn't able to fulfill it, but tried to fulfill it. So we see in this hadith that the action was fulfilled by only one, but both of them had a firm intention. Both of them have the same outcome. Both of them have the same outcome. Inshallah, next week I'll briefly mention this hadith again and give a brief commentary. I wanted to mention it now because it's very closely connected to the previous narrations. I'll mention this briefly next week, next lecture, inshallah. And um, do read ahead because the hadiths which are going to conclude the chapter of ikhlas, sincerity, are very beautiful hadiths, inshallah. Um, it's difficult to give a time as to when we'll conclude the chapter, but I'm predicting two lectures, inshallah. In the next two lectures, we'll conclude the chapter of Ikhlas, 12 hadiths. And I hope you've been benefiting, inshallah. And the chapter after this is a chapter of Tawbah, turning back to Allah. So beautiful is the connection, intention, and now turning back to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the ability to um, take full benefit of these lectures.